The Buddha said that the mind is the forerunner. Mind precedes all states. And the Buddhist path of practice helps us to understand how the mind works. Not just in theory, but in our actual experience. And in understanding how the mind works to protect us from unskillful thought, speech and action. Thought, speech and action which harms ourselves and which harms others. Through understanding the mind, how the mind arises, how the mind operates to produce speech and action, we can start to become aware of the danger areas in our thinking. And in starting to identify those danger areas, learn what to do about them. Tonight I'd like to talk about some of the ways that the practice helps us to do this, particularly in the light of suicide. Several people have come to the monastery recently with stories about someone close to them committing suicide. One story was about a mother who not only killed herself but killed her two-year-old child. When we hear about people committing suicide, which we do more and more these days, I think probably if you ask anyone in this hall, have they heard of someone, do they know someone, or they know someone who knows someone, most people today would say yes, they're familiar with suicide. And very often when we look at the circumstances surrounding the person's life, we can explain why they did that in terms of the social circumstances, the uh, conditions that they were living in, the conditions that they were subject to, maybe their uh, cultural background. And all of these things are obviously contributing factors. But what I'd like to do tonight is to encourage you to reflect that mind precedes everything else. And no matter what the different cultural aspects or social aspects are, if we understand the mind and we understand what produces the mind, then we can see the common thread. We can see how people from very different backgrounds and with very different life circumstances get to the same point of desperation and feeling that there's no alternative. And not only that there's no alternative, but that this is a good alternative. Because very often people take the act of suicide as a solution to their problems. And when the person was telling me about their relative who had killed herself along with her child, it was very easy because of that person's circumstances to say, oh yes, I can see she was desperate, she didn't have any alternatives. But in the group of people who was uh, sitting listening, someone else was talking about their golf partner's friend or golf partner's relative who committed suicide from a completely different set of uh, conditions, completely different social background and yet that person committed suicide in an equally violent way, literally self-destructed so there was no trace left. And this is uh, a cause for us to reflect what's the same in both of those situations. And not only what's the same in their situation, what's the same in my situation? Because understanding the mind is not about just understanding other people. 
and being able to help other people but to help ourselves. When we're learning to observe the mind in meditation, in daily life with mindfulness, we start to see that what we took to be my thoughts, my thinking, me, are actually produced by various causes and conditions which influence what arises in the mind at any time. What we see, what we hear, what we taste, what we touch, what we smell, what we think about, all of these things trigger the mind. The mind arises as a produced phenomenon produced by what we come in contact with now or what we've come in contact with in the past. It doesn't arise the way we wish it, the way we want it, on cue. In this meditation that we've just spent together, you can observe how many silly thoughts come how many extraneous thoughts come, not to do with sitting here at all. Thoughts that we don't want, or maybe thoughts that we like. And when they come into the mind, we find that we get involved with them, even though we're supposed to be paying attention to the breath. And whether it's a thought we like or a thought we don't like, we may not be able to put it down and go back to the breath. And when we repeat this again and again and again, we start to believe that it's true that these thoughts aren't me and mine. So eventually, when a thought comes into the mind in meditation, even if it's very interesting, even if it's uh, delightful, even if it arouses our emotions, we learn not to pursue it to put it down because it's a thought that's come at the wrong time in the wrong place we're paying attention to the meditation object and we see that it's possible by not feeding a thought to allow that thought to naturally cease we start to not only become sceptical about the thoughts that come into the mind, which previously we took to be the truth, real, because they're in my mind, but we also see that the power that we had given to thoughts to direct our speech and our behaviour, because they were in the mind, they must be the truth, I must have to do something with them, we realise we don't have to do anything with them. We can just let them go. And someone was telling me just recently that they were feeling very bored because they'd finally gotten some time off from work and after the initial uh, glow of having a day to themselves, they thought, what can I do next? And boredom came because they're not used to having time on their own. And they thought, well... I'll go and meditate because I've been talking about wanting more time for meditation for such a long time. I'll go and meditate. And they did. And without even trying to kill off that thought of boredom or to change it into something more respectable, they went and watched their breath. And surprise, surprise, that boredom, which seemed so serious, seemed as though it should be listened to, just evaporated and when they got up from their meditation it was no longer there and this is what we can experience for ourselves challenging the 
value that we give to thinking. When we start to recognize how our thoughts are produced by what we've been in contact with, either now or in the past, then we start to also be careful about what we expose our mind to because we understand that seeing something that we don't like can put us into a bad mood that might last for an hour or two if we're not careful, if we don't recognise where that came from, if we believe that mood as being accurate, the truth. We realise that if we continually expose our mind to things which upset us, it becomes much easier to be upset with even things that didn't previously disturb us. We become good, skilled at becoming upset because that's what we are practicing again and again and again. It may not be being upset if we're in an environment where we're constantly triggered to want what we don't have or to want what someone else has. Then we find that we get good, we get better at wanting in meditation, we have the opportunity to observe the effects of our environment, the effects of our world on the mind. And we recognize again that the mind that arises in the moment is a produced phenomenon. It doesn't belong to me. It's not personal property, it's the result of cause and effect. Now how does this help us to refrain from unskillful speech and behaviour? How does it protect us from going down the road of suicide? Well, the person who gets to the point of committing suicide doesn't get there just at that moment. It's the end result of a whole chain of cause and effect, a whole series of interaction between the internal world of that person and the world that they experience. It's the end of very often weeks, months, sometimes years of exposure to toxic experiences, we might say, unhappiness, unpleasantness, things which constantly experienced, particularly over time, weaken the mind because what the mind is being exposed to again and again and again is what is bad for it, what triggers unwholesomeness, anger, desire, unfulfilled wishes. And when that is what is triggered in the mind, that is what the mind reacts with. Irritation, the reaction is anger. More irritation, more anger, until it becomes more and more difficult for the mind to respond with anything else but negativity. And negativity saps one's mental energy. And when someone experiences that over time, and particularly close to home, in their intimate relationships particularly, the mind 
is weakened to the extent that the person feels that there's nothing else to life but this kind of negative experience. And being in that kind of uh, predicament, the mind is unable to look outside that very narrow horizon. The choices, the options that one has are limited because the mind has become so weakened by what one is continually experiencing. When we're practicing this path, we have certain tools at our disposal to make us aware of not only how the mind is produced, but where the mind is heading. And the uh, most uh, well-known of those tools is mindfulness with clear comprehension. The Pali word is sati, mindfulness, the bare attention, just knowing, observing what's going on. And sampajanya is the Pali word for clearly understanding what is happening and what the consequences are of what is happening in the mind. To have this mindfulness with clear comprehension means that instead of believing the thoughts that are coming into the mind, instead of taking them as the truth, as accurate, as the whole story, we start to be able to stand back with detachment and observe the quality of mind that's arising. So, for example, to recognize anger is present rather than feeling angry. Disappointment is present rather than being disappointed. Desire is present rather than wanting. Knowing, and then knowing where that takes us. That's the mindfulness is the knowing part. The clear comprehension understands where we're heading with that kind of thinking. Whether the, what is the purpose? What are we trying to achieve with the thought, the speech and the action that's being produced in any moment? So when anger is present and we notice that anger is present again and again and again, what is the effect of that state of mind on our mental health, on our emotional state, on our physical energy, on the way that we think, speak and act later on during the day? This is the uh, fundamental, central practice of being able to observe the mind without believing it, without getting carried away with it, without acting on it. Now when we're asking ourselves, what is the purpose and am I achieving it? Where do I want to head? with this thought, speech and action. Until we've developed deep understanding of ourselves and of life, till we have that very deep wisdom, one of the benchmarks that we use is our commitment to the five precepts, to a level of morality that protects us and protects those that we share our life with. When we are examining 
our thinking, when we're examining where our thoughts are taking us, we reflect on them in the light of the first precept particularly, which is not to harm oneself or others. The second precept, not to take what is not given. The third one, to refrain from sexual misconduct, to keep one's commitments in relationships. The fourth one, not to use speech which is dishonest or harsh or tail-bearing. And the last one, not to use drugs and alcohol which confuse the mind. Now, when our thoughts start to take us in the direction of breaking any of those precepts, then we already know that we need to be on guard. If our thoughts are taking us into that kind of territory, there's already something wrong. But whether we take that seriously, obviously, will depend on our commitment to keeping the precepts. If we haven't reflected on them, if we haven't contemplated them, if we haven't worked out why these precepts are protectors rather than just uh, killjoys, things that make life uh, not as pleasant or not as fun as, they could, as it could be, then when our mind is pointing us in the direction of harming, we won't stop and think twice because we can convince ourselves very easily about the most outrageous things. But if we have this commitment to harmlessness particularly, then long before we get to the point of actually going out and killing ourselves or killing someone else, we will have put the brakes on, the brakes of mindfulness, the brakes of clear comprehension. For someone who's in a very stressful situation or who is not exposed to what is good and wholesome, the mind becomes more easily unbalanced and becomes less able to find a way out of the predicament that they're in. And so the other thing which we understand is a protector for ourselves is to keep company with people who understand the mind people who can support us, people who can guide us when we feel that we've lost the plot, when we feel that there's no way out. Very often when people become desperate to the point of thinking about harming themselves, they don't have the mental strength to seek solutions themselves. They need someone else to come along and show them that there's some light. So again, if we are practicing this path and we're making the effort to come to places like this to hear the teaching, we're feeding the mind what is good for it and we're also opening ourselves to the opportunity to be with other people who are practicing, who are dealing with life's ups and downs also and who are using the teaching to help them to make sense of life. And so this is a tremendous support for anyone who feels that they can't find the way out of the difficulty they're in. Now apart from commitment to the precepts, using mindfulness with clear comprehension when we're in the middle of the experience. The other part of practice which helps us when we are going through hard times is what is called wise attention. Yoni so manasikara. Wise attention in 
Buddhist practice is about continually holding our experience up against the truth which the Buddha pointed out. The truth particularly that relates to what is called the three characteristics of existence. The three characteristics of existence, impermanence, unsatisfactoriness and not self. How does this help us if we get into a very difficult situation? How does this help us to understand the mind? The first of these three characteristics, anicca in Pali, impermanence, means that everything that comes into being comes into being only temporarily. Nothing lasts forever. And even while it's arising, it's changing, changing until eventually it changes beyond recognition. Now if we are in the middle of a very desperate frame of mind, if we've reflected on impermanence, if we've noticed that impermanence is true in everything else that we've observed in our life, in our own body, in the world around us, then to be able to recognize this state of mind is also impermanent. This state of mind also won't last. This state of mind also will pass is a tremendous help. And if we believe that and then we notice that the unhappy mind arises again in the next moment, we have to again remember, ah, this is also impermanent. Let me see where, how long it lasts. Or let me see what produced it. when we're able to reflect in this way, just that instant of let me see is an instant of mindfulness. It's an instant of stepping back from the state that we're believing, the state that is driving us to unskillfulness. So not only is the mind that's produced impermanent, but whatever circumstances we find ourselves in, these too are impermanent. Everything is in a state of flux and flow, including the best of things and the worst of things. If we're in the middle of a desperate situation, we may not believe that, so we have to keep wisely reflecting paying attention to our experience in the normal course of things so that it becomes obvious to us that everything is impermanent. The next of the three characteristics is that life is inherently unsatisfactory because even the best times don't last. And so much of what we experience happens out of our control. This body follows its own nature from birth to, through ageing to death, just as an example. And the Buddha said that no matter how clever we are, how rich we are, how powerful we are, there are certain things in life that we don't have control over. Now if we are in the middle of a terrible situation and we have heard the teaching on unsatisfactoriness then we can bring that up as a description of where we find ourselves right now. This is dukkha, the Pali word for unsatisfactoriness. This terrible situation, my failure me, which is how we so often relate to any problem that we have. This is what the Buddha was talking about when he talked about unsatisfactoriness. 
This is a description of life, not my personal inadequacy. Now having said that, if we've also understood how the mind is conditioned by influences and causes, we understand that our behaviour is one of those conditions. So it doesn't let us off the hook to say, well, it's all just dukkha. What it helps us to do is to say, what is my part in producing this situation in my life right now? What things in this situation can I do something about? What things can I change? And what things can't I change? The situation arises produced through causes and conditions, the mind that knows that situation, deals with that situation, is also produced by causes and conditions. How can I produce favourable conditions for supporting my mind, for sorting out this situation? What things in both my mind and in my life do I need to change? Do I need to get rid of? Do I need to let go in order to produce the kind of life that I want? If we have an understanding about conditionality, if we have an understanding about cause and effect, then we've got something to work with even in the most drastic situation. The last of the three characteristics is the teaching on anatta, non-self. And this again invites us to reflect on the causes and conditions that are operating in our life at any time. When we're looking at the mind, when we're looking at the thoughts that come into the mind, without the teaching on non-self, we believe whatever comes into our mind as the truth. The emotions that are triggered by the thoughts that come into the mind, we take to be me. We take them to be what is the truth. When we start to contemplate in terms of non-self, we are opening up for investigation even our most treasured thoughts and emotions, the ones that we really identify with as having justification for really being who I am. When we are exploring what non-self means, everything is open for that kind of investigation. Everything is open to be traced back to its source. Where did that thought come from? What produced that emotional reaction? What do I need to replace that with if I want to be happy? All of this kind of work needs to take place when things are going well for us. If we don't do this kind of work and practice it and become skillful at it, when we've got sufficient mental energy, sufficient emotional strength, sufficient confidence in the truth of the teaching, then if we find ourselves in a very difficult, desperate situation, we won't have the strength of mind, the clarity of mind to do this kind of work. And that's what happens when people reach the state of desperation. That's why so often they need someone else to show them the way out. Just by doing 
the practice as outlined by the Buddha, practicing keeping precepts, practicing mindfulness with clear comprehension, practicing right effort, not allowing unwholesome thoughts to take up residence in the mind, actively inviting wholesome states to be present in the mind. All of these things lead towards being able to take control of the mind, to lead the mind away from dangerous situations. But we need to keep repeating these skills again and again and again until they become second nature. In terms of considering suicide to be a solution to one's problems, the Buddhist teaching is very clearly that this is not the case because we have the uh, understanding that this isn't the only life that we've lived up until now and that at the end of this life unless we're enlightened unless we have no more desire to be here then we're going to be reborn somewhere else the desire not to be here in the Buddhist uh, way is different from the desire of wanting to get rid of oneself because life is too difficult too unhappy, too unpleasant. When one acts in that way, thinking that one can solve one's problems by killing oneself or killing someone else, one is acting because life hasn't been what we've expected. The person who kills themselves would uh, not take that course if their life was pleasant, if things weren't so stressful. It's an attempt to try to control life to be the way we want it to be or we would have liked it to be. And that desire to control is the desire which will take us into another life. So in fact what one does is one just produces new conditions the mind of the person who's committed suicide will be reborn somewhere with a new set of conditions to deal with. It won't be the end of the journey. Now having said that, it's impossible for any of us to judge where someone would be reborn because they've committed suicide. Because we won't know or don't know, can't know, what that person's state of mind was at the time of their death. Someone might feel tremendous peace that now finally it's going to be over. Even with wrong understanding there's a sense of peace. Or someone might feel very angry that they're uh, able to punish the people who've uh, hurt them so much and that might be present at the time of death. We don't know. So we can't say uh, in a blanket way this is what happens to people who commit suicide but if you just again reflect on the way the mind is produced by causes and conditions one can see that to work up through thought speech to action to kill oneself and to kill others takes a lot of mental energy and that mental energy becomes another condition in one's uh, experience and if one has given a lot of time and energy a lot of thought to ending one's life then that becomes a very strong impression on the mind and so it can become a habit in future lives when things are difficult if one hasn't developed other resources that condition can
can again direct one's behaviour. This is true for any kind of thought, speech and action which we repeat over time and also which we repeat in circumstances where there's a lot of mental investment in what we're doing. Things that we take really seriously. Things that we value. And that's why it's so important to use the mind wisely to put our time and energy into skillful, wholesome states so that those ones become what dominate the mind. Those become our habit patterns not only for this life but for future lives as well. In learning about the mind we can't do that just through theory. We have to apply these skills, these techniques in the meditation and in our daily life and keep on reflecting on the teaching again and again and again until we see for ourselves with insight, inner knowing that this is the truth. Only then can that truth be a real refuge for us even in the most desperate of situations. So may this teaching be of benefit to all of us here and may the merit of this teaching help us all to attain Nibbana. If anyone has any comments or questions I'd be happy to try to answer them. Yes, there's a question about in the teachings there are instances of uh, enlightened monks um, terminating their life and uh, these were circumstances where the, the uh, monks in question were fully enlightened, they had no more um, uh, desire to be here and they considered they had always in those circumstances had serious uh, illnesses which required... Um, a lot of uh, care on the part of others and uh, they felt that uh, there was no uh, purpose to be served in prolonging their life and uh, in those circumstances the Buddha um, that they were the only circumstances in which the Buddha didn't uh, show disapproval for um, monks taking their life so it wasn't that they were uh, dissatisfied with life but they uh, had finished their work and uh, they were just living out the uh, remainder of their time. So if you reach the point of um, being fully enlightened, that uh, might be an occasion. But before that, we have to uh, keep on doing the work. There's a story also from Sri Lanka of um, a time when there were many Arahat monks going uh, wandering through the countryside and they came to a, a place where there was famine and they knew that there was a, a great difficulty for people to support them and uh, all of them were enlightened and so they uh, decided to relinquish the life force because they didn't want to um, be a burden on the people in that area who were already uh, struggling trying to uh, feed themselves. So there are instances of, um, of enlightened beings um, giving up their uh, will to live, having finished the work that needed to be done. And I didn't intend this talk to be a definitive uh, explanation of suicide. I just want to, uh, wanted to show how Ultimately, it's understanding the mind that is uh, the protector for ourselves and uh, for others. And sometimes we can see people who are lost and who don't have any clue on uh, what produces the mind and how to get out of difficulties they're in. And so we can be 
a, uh, a good friend by showing them that there is a way of understanding the mind. That doesn't mean that we understand exactly what's going on for them and that we've got necessarily a solution to their problem but that we can show them it is possible to understand the mind and to gradually little by little work our way out of whatever difficulty we find ourselves in. And now we'll just finish by paying respects to the Buddha Dharma Sangha. <laughs>